Hi, this video includes um, some notes on classroom observations that were made at two classrooms at the University of Minnesota observing technology implementations, in particular what happens when everybody has a device. Uh, one of the classrooms was um, by Molly Rojas and they were reading poems and they were creating digital stories with their poems. In another classroom with Jay Hatch, uh, the students were primarily answering questions through a response system chime in created by the University of Minnesota. It could be something else, however, it could be poll everywhere or it could be uh, a system of clickers, but in this case it was chime in. Um, and students were responding to that in real time, as well as being able to look at any reading or PowerPoint when they needed them. And then the third place I observed was the Minnesota Teen Tech Center, and this is located at uh, the Hennepin Libraries. It's brand new, uh, created with the support of Best Buy, and they won a grant, and also the Intel Computer Clubhouse Network. Uh, this is uh, the set of classroom observations are only, you could say, a starting point because. It is only once you have a good um, tool to measure with that once you develop a tool then you can use it to measure what you're trying to measure. And when we think of education holistically it can be difficult to measure in one classroom observation what's going well um, and what's not going that great. It's in some sense if we think of invisible learning and technology making learning increasingly happenstance or just happening anytime and anywhere, um, it becomes just harder to measure that. So invisible learning has some measurement difficulties and a lot of times we can just go on students' perceptions of whether they're improving and how they're improving. Um, but anyhow, the goal of these observations is really to um, provide some positive and constructive feedback into how we can make uh, classrooms better or environments better and as an evaluator, I always believe that there is room for improvement and I hope that comes across with these slides that is not uh, focused in, in highlighting anything negative in particular, but just that uh, there is room to always do things better and also it is important to highlight um, some of the different activities that are taking place and how those activities are helpful for the students. So let's now go on theories and models. I wanted to explore this a little bit because it kind of frames what we're looking at in a sense. Um, you have the TPAC model, for example, which highlights technology, pedagogy, and content. And that in between, between them, uh, what's technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge, for example. So this is a better model of it. other models focus on well, what are 21st century skills and you have meta knowledge foundational knowledge in this case humanistic knowledge that's um, our model shows that you can use technology to substitute for augmenting for modification and for redefinition so, and the, the redefinition part is kind of interesting. It's similar to Prensky's doing things, not just always with new tools, but really using new tools to do things in new ways. So, we think of Prensky and his use of technology is going further. So, you can dabble with technology, you can do all things in all ways, you can do all things in new ways, so you can do new things in new ways. Um, what does that really mean, right? So, it depends on how we frame them. Um, some other Scholars have shown that you know it, it. It sometimes it's hard to actually be novel in some sense, because even when we look at the Horizon Report and things that are brand new, they even fall within categories or, or types of, of learning. In this case, um, Piedra can't remember his name right now, but he he divides it into five. So you have social mobility, visualization, storytelling, and gaming. You can see that the Horizon report, some of the new changes, they still file within, within those five categories. Um, you know, you could say that the goal of students is to develop critical thinking skills and a personalized learning environment. So what is to create a personalized learning environment? What is to really teach yourself? 
the University of Minnesota in its mission has that element to it. So you have professional graduate, undergraduate students, um, and they're trying to not just learn skills to succeed at the job, but also learn how to acquire skills, learn to learn, such as uh, um, you focus in that constructivist type of mentality. And um, yeah, you, you have to not just learn content, but learn how to uh, get better when you have a challenge, when you're faced with a difficult situation. And mobile devices, for example, which in this case is what we're highlighting because we're doing a one-to-one -one initiative, can be looked in different ways. So they could be used content creation, basic communications, delivery training, info and access, social networking, and in, I mean, so many ways. You could look at them in a Bloom taxonomy type of way as well. You can use them to create, evaluate, analyze, apply, understand, remember. So there, there's many ways in which you can use mobile devices. There's again a little bit more of that. You can substitute, you can augment, you can modify, you can redefine. And then what are we preparing ourselves to? So Moravec, you know, Moravec has a decided 3.0 when we're increasingly complex, more focused on design, contextual, and, and then we're moving towards yeah, a society of nomads, right? So that's what he highlights it as. It's important in technology also to be aware. That horizon report in this case, um, the hype curve that is uh, published by Garner of what what technologies are coming and what is their potential productivity looking like, uh, this fusion of innovations is relevant. There are many other things here. I won't click all of them, but there there are many of them that are relevant. One of the most important ways to think at, at uh, these changes is looking at some of the standards that we're right now promoting. So for teachers, we're focused on student learning professional growth, data citizenship, digital edge work, and digital age learning. And uh, for students, we kind of want them to come out with, with this to improve the creativity and innovation, the communication and collaboration, the research and information, the critical thinking, the digital citizenship, and their technology cooperations. So that's kind of some of the things that we're focused on uh, in terms of the learner. Let's see, and that there's that balance sometimes between play and, and physical and emotional safety. You have, you know, what is your professional identity? That increasingly that there's a focus in seamless learning or invisible learning also as well. And as in learning happens everywhere. If learning happens everywhere, what does that mean? Or, and, and what does that mean for both? What's the role of education? What's the role of measurements? Uh, again, invisible learning, both the formal, the non-formal, the informal, the serendipitous as well. So then when we think of old tools and new tools, well, uh, the reason I put this title on a Jay Hash uh, presentation um, or, or course when I went to, to record that is that uh, Jay uh, had a great lesson plan, but guess what, when he gets there, well, he has uh, technological problems with it. Um, again, it's important to remember that technology is everything. It spans from, you know, the desk that you're using, the, the paper book that you're reading from. The, I mean, they were all at some point a noble and innovative technology. We didn't just come out of a womb speaking thousands of languages like we do today, um, or just having all these different complicated and complex fields. But um, we really just, you know, developed that over time. And um, that's important to take into account is that we are surrounded by technology, whether it's a table, whether it's a light bulb, whether it's you know just most of the things around us in an urban or developed environment. Um, but anyhow, he got to class and technology really wasn't working, so he ended up having to walk up and go and interact with students by actually, you know, being very active um, motion-wise and just walking around the classroom and talking to them and, you know, the students all had their devices but they really couldn't access the materials he needed them to access and the chime in or the notes. So he had to uh, walk around. His computer wasn't working well with the projector that day. Uh, he ended up having to borrow mine. Um, interesting was to see, you know, so uh, and, and that kind of went across the different classes that I observed or environments was that it, it really, the device matters. Um, so if you have some students, you know, looking at them in the iPad, some in their phone, but the device matters only when there are differences that are meaningful for either that student or for that course 
or, or, or the materials they're using that day. But many materials actually, like presentations or um, you know, if they want to access a website, the device doesn't really matter that much in that situation. So for a lot of things, bring your own device works. So in a college setting in particular, where we already know from OIT surveys that most students come with a device to, to school, uh, that is particularly important when we think of where are we headed towards. And yes, not every device has every functionality. For example, Flash doesn't work on an Apple device, and that can create problems. But overall, uh, there is a devices are increasingly focused on well cross-platform universal design. Cisco in networking is focused on bring your own device. So the business world is kind of focused on bring your own device as well. So there's an interest in, in the bring your own device model. And I think it'll permeate to at least higher education definitely and maybe K to twelve as well. But we, we need to see. Uh, there's a benefit to it. So here is uh, him, Professor J Hatch uh, using Chime in. Chime in again it's a uh, very promising tool, uh, but development kind of stalled and it really hasn't added new features in a while. The lack of new features and also how uh, programs in the internet, if you or, or, or just uh, through computers, if you don't use them, they tend to just fall behind over time if they're not constantly being updated now. So we have that iterative constant updating process. So if that's not happening, then probably uh, they're following a little bit, they're getting a little bit old over time. So that's also there. Again, there is uh, some of these pictures just illustrate that you know some students have both their cell phone and a computer with them. Some have all three. They have a tablet, a computer, and a cell phone or a smartphone with them uh, while the course goes on. So you have that situation where yeah, you you can use more than one device effectively and for the course. And he had one of the parts that I enjoyed of watching his courses. At one point in time, or, or a couple times, one student would be, well, I can't really access Chime In. So he would quickly ask the whole class, can you guys access Chime In or not? And on the first two occasions, it was like, well, yeah, everybody else can, but that student couldn't. Uh, later talking to Jay, he told me that basically when they bring a new device and they haven't used before, sometimes they're glitches. But then on another occasion, he, um, so in that in that occasion, it seemed like the student simply was using a new device, or that student was using her, her cell phone that day, her, her smartphone. And on other occasions, though, it's he can ask quickly, are you guys able to access? And everybody was like, nope, we can't access your, uh, your chiming question. And it must have been a server overload or, or some sort of a website uh, like too many tasks being requested because it fixed itself soon after. Uh, but yeah, they, they have problems uh, initially being able to respond to to the to the chiming questions online. But they could respond to that girl over there that the student she also has, you know, cell phone on one hand, computer on another, so that's that's pretty common. Um, doesn't seem like prohibiting people from using technology. It's the way what goes in this course, you sometimes saw them you know, Facebook or Pinterest or doing other things that they shouldn't be probably doing, but, um, you know, I'm not their instructor in that sense, and I don't know if that's affecting their grades, which you know, sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't affect their grades. It's just part of that student's uh, learning style. So uh, it depends, something to, to consider. So let's now go to Molly's Rojas course. So Molly didn't have, uh, so in her case, I named the creative and remixing because Unlike Jay, where uh, you know students will primarily have the course that use old tools and they use new, new tools, and the discussion was, well, is new really better than old? When is new better than old? Um, should we discard some of the tools that have worked for forever? In the case of Molly, um, she was doing exercises with them that they couldn't be able to do otherwise. So they were able to add their audio and video, if they wanted to, to, uh, to a poem and, and present that poem. Most people just had uh, pictures um, and narration uh, to describe both the event and to enunciate it as they felt it was more compelling. So they had those those two elements. Um, the stories weren't theirs in that sense, just the interpretation. So I think there could have been even greater possibility for remixing if they had the opportunity to not just modify a poem's, um, I guess, public or, or visible interpretation uh, through through the text, but also just for them to have greater access. So um, that's another part uh, to think about.
so these are some other other pictures so so students uh, sharing the iPad so sharing is pretty common as well um, that's one thing that you see with with these new devices they're very flexible so it can easily be you know shared around students being able to access their friends devices and, and look over them in this case too uh, but you can see again smartphones are pretty common as well and uh, the other part that's common is that some students simply prefer to to still you know jot, jot down their notes so they may have a computer with them in class that day but they just prefer to take notes in pencil which is very important again when we think of always new ways and just how technology is changing um, we won't necessarily ever probably see that every student's comfortable with you know writing on an iPad what we're really doing is that some students may feel more comfortable writing on an iPad and some students may decide they still want to use paper and what's actually going to get them to move forward maybe a different type of innovation in a different sphere in a sense so uh, I mean this is a free market type country so people should be able to you know bring the device they want to bring even if that means a pen and paste uh, a pen and paper and they're just jotting down notes so it, it should be that that flexible for students Here are some of the pictures. Let's see. Okay, that one doesn't want to load. That one did load. That was the one which is open. So again, more than one device sometimes, or a lot of students with iPads. Um, they've worked in part of it together. So first they discussed the different questions, they found answers, they talked them on each other in groups, and it had a lot of, it, it was a great uh, class exercise. Um, students were able to to engage quite a bit with each other before sharing their presentation due uh, to, to the whole course so they then discussed you know the, the different elements of poetry they discussed how um, it just well, how images and poetry work together uh, I mean it was a pretty in-depth exercise it was really good to see uh, see her course see him being in those small groups and talk together uh, it was very student-centered in that sense, and also just means students pick the poem that they identify with the most, um, and and that's why they selected that poem. The themes of the poems tended to be immigrants and the struggles that they faced, or just uh, some of the difficulties faced by some people. I mean, it was a pretty profound type of poetry as well, uh, but any type of poetry in a sense, to being able to then narrated to create a resource from that poetry, a remix of that poetry. I think that's fascinating. It's, it's a great uh, class activity because it builds upon the work of others. So it was really good to see that. I enjoyed going to most courses and seeing how she, she did that. Um, and um, she, uh, yeah, that I wish I, I, I could go and see some more of her work. Um, same as with Jay. I mean, visiting both of their courses and seeing the quality that they bring, or the professionalism and the creativity that they bring to, to their classrooms was really something. Uh, in addition to visiting the classrooms, I had the, the opportunity to visit the Minnesota Teen Tech Center. Um, this center comes out of the Intel Clubhouse, Computer Clubhouse Network Milestones Initiatives. Um, They've been at this now for over 15 years, getting close to 20 now, and there's many of them across the country. Um, the one that I visited is one of the newest ones, and it's really part of a new initiative together with the Best Buy. And Best Buy provided around $100,000 in, in like grant money and also just a bunch of equipment to three different sites. So you have a site in Miami, a site here in the Twin Cities um, at the Hennepin County Library, and a site in, in Chicago. And things can go there and use whatever tools they, they have there to express themselves. And uh, I thought your Youth Voices has done a good job with this over the years too. But uh, yeah, they just have these other cameras for stop animation. They have uh, and a green screen for videos. They have uh, high quality microphones and they have a recording studio and they have um, different mobile also equipment such as a few iPads for a, a team group they have at some point too. Um, and it's really organic. They, that's what they focus on. So I, I went there and I met with Aaron. Let's see if Aaron in any of these pictures. Um, I had a picture of Aaron. Well, Aaron was showing when he was he was using this DJ app at one point to show students um, how how to 
just create a beat. Uh, so that's the kind of things they can do. They can, uh, um, you know, in this case, he was projecting the iPad to, to show students how to use a DEA um, play. But yeah, they were um, various other things that he showed within the course of that day students had to do. They were working with this other student in their stop animation video. Uh, that was uh, pretty interesting to see as well. And um, you know, this student, for example, was there too. But this is some of the student projects that come out of the teen center. And there's very creative work that comes out of it. And they had just had students come and discuss photography the day before. There were many photography books laying around. Um, again, they can do stop animation. <coughs> they can... A music apparently here in Twin Cities is the bestseller. The greatest difficulty they have right now is that they are located in a place where there are not that many schools nearby. Um, and the school that is nearby is a private school. And it does maybe create a problem in the sense that there's not already there a community. And the kids then have to find it from, you know, their, out, their marketing or their uh, other libraries and just word of mouth. But it's not as easy as you might have been in a place that's more community-oriented to begin with. I mean, downtown, it's, it's a business kind of area. Uh, so that's one of the challenges that Aaron and, and the team of volunteers and other workers that he has there are going to have to uh, face. That's the hurdle they face. But <clears throat> being only 11 weeks old, I mean, the place already has a good membership, you would say. And it has a lot of potential to, to grow. Um, they haven't yet done much in robotics, for example, or things like Scratch and programming because those kids haven't yet arrived in a sense, but they do have already a good music interest developing. So a lot of kids are already working in the music part of it. And again, the interest can be from gaming to filmmaking to computing to graphic design to you know, digital photography. So they, they, there is a lot of potential uh, for students to just experiment and the computers I mean if they have a they're frozen uh, they have a cold freeze uh, so they can't really style programs when they come they can but they get formatted or erased uh, when they leave but if they um, they want to have those programs and there's a program that they're interested in and always having there apart from them being already loaded up with Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, they, if they need another software, they can ask uh, Aaron and their team would will add that software. So when they come at 2 p.m., it's usually open from 2 to, to 8 or 2 to 6, depending on the day, um, they can have that program available. So it's, again, organic is a word that Aaron mentioned a lot, and I could see why. Um, so it's a good site to further explore informal learning. Um, I talked to some of the teens there, and they were interested in the idea of, well, what they get, what is, what are they looking for in a sense, how they feel it's going to help them, how they think it's going to affect their future, and um, how they feel it fits in within their other learning experiences. Um, they were interested in some of those questions. One of the aspects that we were thinking about is maybe going back later in time. I told Aaron, Aaron, you know, it's uh, starting. You don't yet have what you probably consider to be um, your idea and a lot of the teens probably don't yet know how it's impacting them so he was he appreciated that um, frankly it's just yeah he needs some more time to build a community there and then we can have a more uh, in-depth analysis or we can um, sit around talk to the kids and have made a focus group so I was thinking of a few focus groups uh, with teens there and that may be a way to to get at their own learning experience again with invisible learning perception is probably one of the best measures we can come across because how they perceive the experience it's it's personalized it's that contextualization of it that you learn what you want to learn that's very connectivist way of thinking too but um yeah what you learn is what you're trying to learn and that is the intended outcome so um we'll see when those focus groups take place, how they feel the learning experiences has helped them. I think Aaron is just going to expand it and, and do more amazing things with the kids there. Um, they, uh, this is, I think I say, let's see, this is uh, the RFP. And so in March last year, so it's just a year ago, they yet didn't know exactly, you know, who was going to win these grants and, and what was going to happen exactly. So. Uh, it's again a Best Buy partnership 
with the Intel Computer Clubhouse network. And it's brand new. It started just this year, uh, 11 weeks ago. This is what they wanted it to look like. MIT was invested in the original one. Partnerships allow for teams to have the professional tools that are used a couple blocks from there by other professionals, by older professionals in creating their work. So again, they had a that's hundred thousand dollars, and they they wanted to to continue their team summits. There's also they have uh, the annual conference to exchange ideas as well. And uh, the libraries that area in the libraries was the one that the one. Um, and they, I think they will, over time, develop that community and really bring those learners together. So this brings me to the last part, um, which is the evaluation piece and an observation and assessment. I use primarily two tools. One of them is the classroom observation tools that the University of Minnesota already has. And a lot of these are peer observations and just for classroom observations that uh, in different ways. And, and what's fascinating about classroom observations is that you really can observe so many different things in a classroom that it's really important to have, before you go observe a classroom, a very clear idea of what you're trying to, to get at. Um, and that was hard for me because I kind of wanted to get really at, in some ways, invisible learning, uh, in some ways how one-to-one -one does, does help them, but I'm also very interested in bring your own device. So moving to that bring your own device world um, and also the informal aspect of it are not usually elements that are picked up by just observing a class. Um, the, the bring your own device maybe, but definitely the, the, the informal part of learning is really hard by just looking at a class. I mean, it's much more of the feedback from students. So that'll take some time uh, to, to get at. And then again, as, as we mentioned before, that the tools developed by um, I, by by them uh, by the the NETS um, guidelines, and, and that they're great. They they really are some of the elements that teachers and students need to focus on. Um, and it's it's good to to use their tool and so uh, to try to grasp with some of that. Um, there are different ways that those tools have been operationalized. So you could, you know, ask these questions, um, fill out these forms based on time. So observe two minutes, record one minute. I didn't use this one in particular, but that's it's available. Um, other tools, how you how you observe literacy. Well, it has a tool at the bottom. Um, this, uh, this PowerPoint also has other interesting elements as well. I invite you to, to just peruse and uh, reuse and, and, and just come here and, and look at this uh, mural and see what tools you find interesting and amusing or, or helpful for your own research in the future. Um, this one is one of the simplest ones and at, I think that you know this is one that maybe people would like to use more. Uh, in a way, they um, do this in a sense. In the data I collected, I recorded uh, a lot of data by visiting these classrooms. I had a, um, I mean, I recorded some audio sometimes. I, you know, took extensive notes of of these uh, classroom visits. I didn't. I mean, I talked to the teachers afterwards. I didn't formally interview them with questions. Um, we did exchange emails. I probably would interview them a little bit further if if I uh, probably in the future. Um, that was an element that I think can be very helpful um, to to just have more connection or communications with the teacher um, and seeing 
their own self assessment of how the module went and how they own, they feel the module could improve as well. These are all good. This this is great. There's an a TPAC one here as well. And TPAC again is the whole technology, pedagogy, content knowledge. And there is a survey of how can you, in a sense, measure TPAC. Has observations, and then this one has like some some guides, things to focus on. So the outputs and inputs, and what are you trying really to to gain at when you. And, and another part was visiting just what the University of Minnesota thinks it's uh, it's good teaching and learning. So I hope you found this interesting. Um, it was a very fun project to to be a part of, and visit these different places. And I think there's more to be done. Thanks.